Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We are here for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We are working our way through the book of Exodus and tonight we are in Exodus chapter 29. So we're very glad to have you with us. We want to invite you to find a Bible of your own if you can and join us in Exodus chapter 29. We'll be there in just a few moments. As always, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to reach out Send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274, and we would love to hear from you. But as I said, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus, and just to do kind of the 30-second review for those who may just now be joining us for the very first time, the people have left Egypt. They are now in the wilderness at the base of Mount Sinai. God is now communicating the law to Moses. We've had some of the basics of the law, including the Ten Commandments. God has given some instructions for building the tabernacle or the tent for worship. He's given them instructions concerning what the priests need to wear. We looked at that last week, and tonight we continue with God's instructions concerning uh, how to consecrate the priest, how to set them apart for the work that they're about to do. And like last week, tonight's chapter is a little bit longer than some of those that we've had over the past month or so, but we will move rather quickly through it tonight as we did a week ago, just kind of giving an overview and hitting some of the highlights there. We won't be digging into the definition of every single word and so on. So let's just jump right into it tonight with the first paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 29, verses 1 through 9. Exodus 29, verses 1 through 9. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them to minister as priests to me. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread and unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers spread with oil. You shall make them of fine wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and present them in the basket along with the bull and the two rams. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. You shall take the garments and put on Aaron the tunic and the robe and the ephod and the ephod and the breastpiece and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod and you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. Then you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. You shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. You shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and bind caps on them, and they shall have the priesthood by a perpetual statute. So you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Up to this point, we have the tabernacle, we have the altar, we have the other furniture, we've got the law, we've got the special garments. And now we finally have the priests. So we are uh, now given the ability to approach God on behalf of the people, the priests are. So God now gives instructions concerning how to consecrate Aaron and his sons for the priesthood. To consecrate is to set apart for a special purpose. To make holy, maybe another way of saying that. Well, up to this point, these men were no more holy than anybody else. They were just normal, everyday people. Uh, but now God explains how to designate these men for the priesthood. We might think in terms of these men being ordained, and I think that word is used down there near the end of this passage. Well, today, of course, in denominational terms, uh, priests and pastors are often ordained. But again, uh, we need to remember that all Christians are priests, aren't we, under the New Covenant? So, you know, yes, there are times we may set someone apart from the congregation to fill a special role. Uh, in the New Testament, for example, in Acts chapter 13, you may remember that Saul and Barnabas are set apart to serve as missionaries. Um, however, those two men really were no more holy than anybody else at that point. They just had a special job to do. Uh, so also, when we recognize men to serve the congregation as elders and deacons, they're no more holy than the rest of us. We are just saying, uh, we want you to do this. We are setting them apart for a special purpose. You know, sometimes, though, um, it's hard to function in a world that only thinks in denominational terms. Um, years ago, I would regularly visit a prison up near Sheboygan. Uh, one of our members down in Janesville was imprisoned up there for a number of years, and it was, I don't know, something like a two-hour drive. And so I wanted my wife to come with me on some of those trips, and I, I checked with the chaplain up there, and I explained, you know, she could uh, go on these visits with me, it would be helpful. Um, and he said, well, she can come along, but only if she's ordained by the church. Well, at that moment, I'm thinking, you know, I'm not even ordained. Um, you know, we don't ordain people in the way that he was thinking. He was so steeped in that denominational terminology. He really 
he couldn't understand. So in response to that, I wrote a, I would say, a very carefully worded letter uh, referencing 1 Peter chapter 2 and the fact that my wife is indeed a priest. You know, she is set apart for a special purpose under the new covenant and so on, and, and that did the trick. And so I'd probably still have that letter somewhere ordaining my wife. Uh, but she would sometimes go with me on those visits, and it was very helpful. But, you know, she's, she's a priest like all of us, and I'm thankful that we were able to do those things together. Um, she did not, however, like riding in the back of the prison transport car with uh, no door handles or, uh, you know, she, she was not comfortable with that. But we, we, we got it done. We got to encourage the guy who was there uh, a number of times through the years. Um, but in this chapter, though, Aaron and his sons, they truly are consecrated. They are set apart. They are made holy. Uh, for the purpose of serving priests on behalf of the entire nation of people. They were the go-betweens, mediating between God and the people. Uh, the process, notice, involves assembling a young bull and two rams without blemish, and then presenting God with the unleavened bread and cakes mixed with oil, unleavened wafers spread with oil. Uh, Aaron and his sons are then to be washed in water, which is interesting. We'll get back to that in just a little bit toward the end of class tonight. And then they are to, once they're washed, put on the garments that we learned about last week. So we spent a whole class last week talking about those special garments and how those were created and the plans for those. Those are now put on. And then they are to be anointed with oil. And by way of review, kings would later be anointed with oil. That was God's way of setting them apart visually. Everybody could see that. And there was evidence you had oil running down your head. And uh, this is the basis of the Hebrew word for Messiah, which is translated into Greek as Christ, the anointed one. And so Jesus then is God's anointed. Christ is not his last name. Jesus Christ is Jesus, the anointed one. And he is chosen by God. He is set apart from the rest of us. But this is the process for anointing and uh, consecrating Aaron and his sons to serve as priests. So let's continue with the next paragraph, Exodus 29, 10 through 18. Exodus 29, verses 10 through 18. Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. You shall slaughter the bull before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. You shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger, and you shall pour out all the blood at the base of the altar. You shall take all the fat that covers the entrails and the lobe of the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and offer them up in smoke on the altar. But the flesh of the bull and its hide and its refuse you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. You shall also take the one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall slaughter the ram and shall take its blood and sprinkle it around on the altar. Then you shall cut the ram up into its pieces and wash its entrails and its legs and put them with its pieces and its head you shall offer up in smoke the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a soothing aroma, an offering by fire to the Lord. In the first paragraph, they were to bring the bull. Now we learn what they need to actually do with the bull. So Aaron and his sons are to lay their hands on the head of the bull. This was symbolic, I believe, of their sin being transferred to the bull. They had to cover their own sin as they were being set apart for priests before they could serve in that way. And so the bull was taking their place as a sacrifice, in a sense. And Moses is to slaughter the bull at the doorway of the tabernacle. You know, imagine the bloody scene here. I mean, it's hard for most of us to picture this, slaughtering an animal right there in the middle or at the doorway of a place where everybody would come to worship. There would have been blood all over the place. So this blood is then to be collected. It is to be put on the horns of the altar. Uh, at the base of the altar as well, while some fat is burned on the altar and the rest of this animal is then burned outside the camp. Well, so also with the ram, but the, the ram can be burned completely on the altar. Uh, some have suggested that the whole animal being burned is symbolic of a complete sacrifice. And I think I understand that. God doesn't just ask for a donation from a particular animal, but the animal is all in, so to speak, isn't it? Well, so also we offer ourselves today as living sacrifices. We don't just donate a bit of our time to God here and there, uh, but we are also all in, all of us. We are dedicated to the Lord completely. And we come back to this reference now to this sacrifice being a soothing aroma. I think this is the second time we have this phrase in the Bible. The first reference is uh, 
Back in Genesis 8.21, if you remember when Noah offered a, a sacrifice after the flood, and it's interesting to me, I think I mentioned this a month or two ago, just as most of us appreciate the smell of meat on the grill, so also with God. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of being serious there. I mean, it's kind of, it's almost like um, it's natural for us. It's, it's a good smell. I'm not saying for all people, not everybody appreciates that like I do, but I think generally speaking, most people smell meat grilling on the grill, and that's kind of a good thing. And um, But the sacrifice here is a soothing aroma to the Lord, and I'm just suggesting that a lot of us can understand uh, what that's like. It smells good. For some reason, God was satisfied by this. So let's continue with the next chunk here, Exodus 29, verses 19 through 25. Exodus 29 19 through 25. Then you shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. You shall slaughter the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, and on the lobes of his sons' right ears, and on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet, and sprinkle the rest of the blood around on the altar. Then you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments and on his sons and on his sons' garments with him. So he and his garments shall be consecrated, as well as his sons and his sons' garments with him. You shall also take the fat from the ram and the fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails and the lobe of the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and the right thigh, for it is a ram of ordination. And one cake of bread, and one cake of bread mixed with oil, and one wafer from the basket of unleavened bread, which is set before the Lord. And you shall put all these in the hands of Aaron, and in the hands of his son, and shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. You shall take them from their hands, and offer them up in smoke on the altar on the burnt offering for a soothing aroma before the Lord. It is an offering by fire to the Lord. In the first paragraph, we dealt with the first ram, which was to be burned up completely on the altar, if I remember that correctly. And now we come to the second ram. The second ram is to be slaughtered, and its blood is to be put on the right earlobes, the right fingers, and the big toes on the right feet of these men. Isn't that strange? I mean, some have suggested maybe this is symbolic of them listening to God with their ears, serving God with their hands and their feet. I don't know. We're not told the purpose for this. I mean, it would have been a, a long-term reminder. It's hard to get blood off. Uh, but the blood from the altar and the oil is then to be put on Aaron and his garments as well as on his sons and their garments. And the various parts of the ram and the oil and the wafer are all to be given to uh, Aaron and his sons to wave before the Lord as a wave offering. And again, this is weird, isn't it? This is so strange to us. This is so foreign to us today. Uh, but these items are then to be burned on the altar before the Lord as an offering. All right, let's continue with the next paragraph here, Exodus 29, 26 through 30. Exodus 29, 26 through 30. Then you shall take the breast of Aaron's ram of ordination and wave it as a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. You shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering, which was waved and which was offered from the ram of ordination, from the one which was for Aaron and from the one which was for his sons. It shall be for Aaron and his sons as their portion forever from the sons of Israel, for it is a heave offering, and it shall be a heave offering from the sons of Israel, from the sacrifices of their peace offerings, even their heave offering to the Lord. The holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him, that in them they may be anointed and ordained. For seven days the one, uh, the one of his sons who is priest in his stead shall put them on when he enters the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place. Well, some re repetition, it seems, uh, kind of a twist, but the, the new information we have here is that they are to take the breast of Aaron's ram offering and they are to wave it before the Lord. And this piece of the animal shall then belong to Aaron and his sons from this point going forward. So in a sense, this seems to be their payment for serving at the altar. This is their portion. They could keep this. And the priests, of course, they were not given a land inheritance, so they couldn't go out and farm the land like most people but they were to make a living off of their service in the tabernacle. This was hard work, and this was their job. This was their responsibility, so they were able to make a living off of this. The other thing that we learn in this passage is that the holy clothing is to be passed down through the generations. And I think we noted this last week, that the clothing was to be heavy duty, and that was for a reason. It was designed to last through many generations. 
and it looks like Aaron's actual garment is to be worn by a new priest for the first seven days of his service, and then probably so on uh, throughout the generations. Just thinking about this, I don't know how much clothing that we have that was passed down from multiple generations. I can't think of anything that I have, that I wear, that my grandfather or my great-grandfather wore. Maybe you do, uh, but generally speaking, clothing just does not last uh, very long. But these things were designed in such a way as to be passed down through the years. All right, let's continue tonight with Exodus 29, 31 through 37. Exodus 29, 31 through 37. You shall take the ram of ordination and boil its flesh in a holy place. Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Thus they shall eat those things by which atonement was made for their, at their ordination and consecration. But a layman shall not eat them because they are holy. If any of the flesh of ordination or any of the bread remains until morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. Thus you shall do to Aaron and to his sons according to all that I have commanded you. You shall ordain them through seven days. Each day you shall offer a bull as a sin offering for atonement, and you shall purify the altar when you make atonement for it, and you shall anoint it to consecrate it. For seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. Then the altar shall be most holy, and whatever touches the altar shall be holy. As I understand this, we pretty much have a holy potluck dinner going on here, but it's not a potluck in the sense of leftovers or everybody bringing some random thing. Uh, but this seems to be a meal where they celebrate the ordination of new priests by eating a part of the sacrifice that was made. And notice only the priests are allowed to partake. So this meal is very exclusive. And in this sense, I almost think of the Lord's Supper. And I know it's not a perfect parallel. We don't have gatekeepers preventing those who are not eligible from partaking. We don't do that. That's up to the individual. Examine yourselves. Uh, that was the passage Josh read for us before the Lord's Supper a couple weeks ago. Uh, we don't examine each other. We're responsible for examining ourselves. Uh, but the Lord's Supper is truly eaten only by those who are priests, in a sense. And that's the comparison. We are the priests. We are the ones who partake of the Lord's Supper, just as these priests were the only ones allowed to partake of this particular meal. Notice here the leftovers are burned with fire. Um, not because the leftovers are bad. I know not everybody likes leftovers. That's not the reason. But these leftovers are holy. And they can't be eaten by anybody who hasn't yet been consecra uh, consecrated. In verse 35, we find this is a seven-day process. So there is a bull offered every day on each of those seven days. This was a huge deal. This was expensive, wasn't it? To be Just think about that, the, the cost of doing this. Well, let's conclude tonight with Exodus 29, verses 38 through 46, through the end of the chapter. Genesis 29, 38 through 46. Now, this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two one-year-old lambs each day continuously. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And there shall be one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of beaten oil, and one-fourth of a hin of wine for a drink offering with one lamb. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and shall offer it with the same grain offering and the same drink offering as in the morning for a soothing aroma, an offering by fire to the Lord. It shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the doorway of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak to you there. I will meet there with the sons of Israel, and it shall be consecrated by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate Aaron and his sons to minister as priests to me. I will dwell among the sons of Israel, and I will be their God. They shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them, I am the Lord their God. Well, this seems to address a basic process going forward. Once those first priests are consecrated, now that they're on duty, uh, these men are then to offer two one-year-old lambs every day, at morning and at evening, from here on out. And they are also to offer a portion of fine flour and wine with one of those lambs. Well, the point of this, according to verse 42, is to pave the way for God to meet with his people and for God to speak with them there at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And through this process, God would consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar as well as Aaron and his sons as priests. Notice in verse 45, God presents this as a relationship. As the people obey, as they do these things, as they follow these instructions, God will be their God and they would be God's people. And then in verse 46, the people would know that God had brought them out of the land of Egypt. 
and God would dwell among them as their Lord and their God. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 29. Uh, tonight, we focused on the consecration of the priest, and I know this hasn't been a chapter full of practical application for us today, uh, but I think there have been some lessons that we've learned. We've noted that as Christians, we are priests. And so in that sense, all of us have been set apart as God's people. Um, was there a sacrifice that allows us as Christians to be sanctified? Of course there was. Jesus died on the cross to set us apart. Were we washed at our ordination? Well, I think we understand, yes, just as Aaron and his sons were washed with water in the process of being ordained as priest, I think we could also make the comparison that we also are washed in the waters of baptism. And so I think that there are some parallels looking back on this. And as we learned last week, just as they put on the priestly garments, so also we put on Christ in baptism. We learned that from Galatians 3, uh, 26 and 27. So thank you for joining us tonight. I want to let you know that I'm going to be out of town, if the Lord wills, over the next several weeks traveling to Tennessee and then hopefully taking the scenic route home through Kentucky and Ohio and Michigan and Minnesota and uh, doing some camping along Lake Superior in the winter, kind of taking the scenic route home from Tennessee. And so I believe we'll have some kind of fill-in lessons, uh, hopefully from World Video Bible School, concerning some of those archaeological discoveries and some of those tours of the Bible lands over there. And that's been very helpful to me in the past to picture those things. So if you only get the updates through YouTube, uh, you'll need to find another way to join us. We are not able to copy those videos and publish them on our own YouTube channel. So we'll send out an email to all of our members. Uh, there is a distribution list for those interested in the live stream. And we'll also post those links on the Four Lakes uh, Congregation live stream Facebook group as well. So uh, make sure that you keep up with us the next few weeks. If, if you only get this through YouTube, let me know. And I'll be sure to send those links out to you personally if you want me to do that. But if we need to pray about something, if we can encourage you in some way, let us know. Get in touch. Info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call, 608-224-0274. And uh, we would absolutely love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight for having made us priests, setting us apart for your service in this world. We pray that we would honor you in everything that we say and do, and even in the things that we think. Tonight we pray for wisdom and courage as we reach out to the world around us, that we would communicate your word clearly and with courage, and that we would be faithful in how we serve you. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, our great high priest. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.